Recording in progress. So welcome to Discover Energy Work. Another week and another person. And that sounds almost like depressing. Yeah, actually, it's amazing. So I, I'm so lucky. And, and thank you, everybody that listens to this podcast, because indirectly, you're encouraging me to go out and talk to people that I really wouldn't talk to otherwise. Well, that's true. Anyway, um, today I have, <laughs> I know, she's looking at me, she's going, what is he on about? Uh, today I have Joe Howard. And Joe Howard, well, we could describe her as the founder of the Happiness Club. And already, I don't know what that means, you know, um, that there should be a club for happiness. Sorry, can't be happy, you haven't got a club, you're not a member. Um, but uh, yeah, no, Joe, I mean, I was introduced to you and the first thing is I, you know, I, I didn't really sort of feel it was happening and that we had trouble and I was like, and I started just following you on, on Facebook uh, because we, we made friends on Facebook. I'm like, wow, you're really interesting. Oh, I really would like to have you on the show. So I must apologize publicly and humbly for like uh, not having you, not getting there and realizing it straight away. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I really love your uh, Facebook posts on the Happiness Club, um, which it, it's, a, it's a group now on Facebook, is it? It is, yeah. So yeah, we have a page on Facebook, um, a free, um, we have a free group and a free page on Facebook for people what we do in a bit more detail as well as the membership club itself which is the happiness club the happiness club so um i imagine um that at some point you felt there was a need to, to encourage people to be happy can you tell us a little bit about that <laughs> why, why did this idea come into existence into being because um, so by trade I'm a I'm an advanced hypnotherapist and a mindfulness practitioner so they're the two sort of tools of my trade if you like so I'm a therapist and um, I'm a therapist because therapy changed my life and so it was a no-brainer for me to retrain and become a person that helped other people um, but I was having these conversations with my one-to-one -one clients where they were saying things to me like um, so if I could just put you in my pocket and take you home with me um, so that you're there all the time or if you could just sit on my shoulder uh, and whisper into my ear as I'm going through my day what that I That would look do. weird though like you'd perch on my shoulder like a parrot <laughs> like me <laughs> no, I, know. I don't know it wouldn't work I mean obviously it wouldn't work it wouldn't work, it it wouldn't work. work. Um, and you know whilst I was tempted to move in with some of them um, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have my own family and my own house, so obviously that wouldn't work either. Mm. Um, but I could remember that feeling from when I had therapy. I mean, I've had mm. so much therapy over the last 25 years, it's not true. But when I first had therapy um, and I was sort of exposed to this amazing world that I didn't know existed before. Um, and I could remember that feeling of wanting to wanting to take my therapist home with me and and I would have this you know I would have this hour and a half with this amazing person once a week <laughs> and I'd have to I'd have to last an entire week all by myself before it's I got really home. weird though isn't it like you you get into an intimate relationship with somebody you share things you haven't shared with anybody and you feel like you might be even ridiculed if you said to anybody and then after an hour they go okay well um you know see you next week it's like what you know it's kind of it's kind of it's a bit of a you know mind mumbling jumbling without i'm trying not to use the f-bomb today because yesterday i just like okay i swear like a trooper so don't not swear for me but well no no it's also we we i have to put a little thing that says by the way this is an explicit podcast. Don't listen in front of your kids, um, which is okay. I can do that if we, if we, uh, if one slips out, as the um, actress said to the bishop. So, so anyway, so, yeah, so, so, so I was having these conversations with my clients, and I could remember feeling that way myself, and and struggling when I was in the depths of my first bout of therapy, struggling with that idea that you know, try trying to live with everyday life and remember the stuff that I was learning in therapy and feeling the changes in myself, but still being presented with the same situations. And it's difficult. 
Mm. And then I had my own clients saying that to me now that I was a therapist. And so I wanted to find a way to support them more without actually having to move in with them. Mm. Um, and then I was having conversations with people who lived hundreds of miles away from me because I was part of a national networking thing. And so I was having conversations with people who lived in London and Scotland and America about having sessions. And I, I not very technical, Richard, I won't, you know, I'm still not very technical, but this was seven or eight years ago and I was even less technical than I am now. And the idea of doing hypnotherapy on Zoom was beyond me. Yeah. Um, and then I was having conversations with local people who wanted therapy, but couldn't afford it. So there were all these different groups of people that weren't quite being served and so it all kind of exploded in my head one day, um, lying on the sofa watching TV with my husband as you do, doing something completely different. And it just all kind of exploded in my head. And I said to him, oh, my goodness, it's a club. It's a club. Um, we'll call it the Happiness Club because that's what I'm all about, because I believe that happiness is the most important thing in life. I believe whatever you want to change or do or undo, what you want in the changing of that thing is to be happier, um, which makes happiness the most important thing in life. Um, and so I was like, oh, OK, it's a club. And we started as a Facebook group and it was largely for my one to one clients at the time. And I posted something in there every single day as something for them to try a technique or a tool or a story about my life that gave me some kind of learning something mm. for them to hold on to every day in between their one-to-one mm. -one sessions with me and then I started talking about it wider and more people said oh well that sounds quite nice actually um mm. I might come and join that so we've grown now we have our own app we're not on Facebook in, as the membership anymore um but we have our own app and it works a bit like a Facebook feed so we give our members what we call these daily strategies. Um, again, just something for them to hold up. I, I, it's a bit cheesy, but I do say to people, I see the club very much as me putting my arms around everyone every morning and saying, it's okay, I've got you. Think about life like this today. Have a go at this today. Try thinking about yourself like this today. And I'm right here if you need me. So the members get 24 seven access to a team now of qualified therapists. So for ad hoc in the moment support and advice. So wow. we have members that don't want therapy, don't want full blown counseling sessions or whatever, but actually just get a bit overwhelmed sometime and could do with someone on the end of the phone who understands what they're going through, knows what they're talking about. Mm. And like you say, you can unload to confidentially knowing that nobody that you know will find out what you've said um mm. which for me is in i mean that was one of the most invaluable things for me about having actual therapy like you said before was having that person that i could tell my deepest darkest to and know that there was no judgment and know that they would try and find a way to help me work my way through that darkness mm. so yeah so that's the club I'm Discover energy work is, I mean, that's, that is fantastic. And it sounds so, um, you know, your club sounds so uh, like it's really fulfilling a need for a lot of people. What, uh, and we'll put a link to it. Um, maybe I think it's probably just on the app store, isn't it? And, and Google Play. Yeah. Um, so it's fairly, and I think if you put in Happiness Club, you're probably going to probably turn, turn up. Yeah. It's just so, um but um, what I'm curious about is, well, I started reading your story and one thing that I really was a, admiring, I can't remember anything about the story, it's typical memory, um, but that you were putting yourself really out there and prepared, being prepared to be vulnerable to say, like, if I've gone from here to being happy, then you can. Um, and I feel that's, I mean, that's just, amazing number one to just share like okay so this is how low it can go and i'm not saying i've gone through the lowest but this was quite low can you share with people like a little bit about your story and and how the change sort of happened yeah i can um so my it's quite a normal story to be fair um in, in today's everyday life but my story really started when i was five um, my parents 
split up. They got divorced. And at the time, because I'm quite old, at the time, it wasn't... <laughs> Don't say that. You don't know how old I am. <laughs> um, but back in the 70s, which is when I was mm. five, mm. it wasn't normal. It wasn't usual for people to get divorced. It wasn't as everyday an occurrence as it seems to be these days. Um, mm. And so it was, for a five-year-old, it was massively traumatic. Um mm. For the grown-ups, it was traumatic, obviously, but at the, back in the 70s, there wasn't any support for the kids going through something like that. They were just kids. Nobody thought that kids understood, so therefore they weren't affected. <laughs> right, right. Well, we know that. That's not true, don't we? We know that kids absolutely. often feel they're responsible for totally, something they've what, done. Yeah, absolutely what I felt. I, I mean, I wrote one of the posts you're probably referring to. I wrote a post about how my dad left me when I was five because that's how I, I interpreted it, that he had left me mm. um, and therefore I must be the most awful, horrible child, the most awful, mm. horrible person that ever, for my dad to have to leave my house. Oh my mm. goodness, how mm. awful must I be? And obviously mm. as a grown up, I know he didn't leave me, he left my mum and there were grown up reasons for that. But at five, all I knew was that my dad was gone. Um, and when you're five, you're completely egocentric. Your entire world is about you. So that was my interpretation was that I'd done something. I had no idea what I'd done, but I'd done something to make him leave. Um, and that's when my anxiety started. So I, I experienced anxiety for many, many, many years of my life, high levels of anxiety. And that's From when I started. five years old. Yeah, I didn't know it was called anxiety then, but um, I, I just, I became very scared, obviously, that if my dad could leave and it would look quite easy for him to do that, <laughs> then maybe everyone else in my life mm. could leave me. Um, yeah. And maybe that, maybe then I would be on my own. So that became a fear that grew inside me. And my, my dad left my mum for somebody else. So he went and remarried and was part of my life. That was fine. Um, my mum obviously moved on and took a new partner, but my stepdad was not a very nice man. He was an alcoholic, he was a bully. Um, he wasn't physically abusive, but he was emotionally and mentally abusive. He didn't think much of himself. He had been abused when he was a child. He didn't think much of himself. And his way of dealing with that was to either drink himself silly or to make everyone else around him feel about this high um so so again all that did and, and i mean he came and left and came and left and came and left that it, that whole thing of my dad leaving and therefore maybe people can leave you just mm. got compounded and compounded because he mm. <laughs> left on a regular basis um and so i kind of spent my childhood feeling like i was pretending to be if you'd known me back there, you would have said I was a happy, friendly little girl. And I was largely scared out my wits. I managed not to swear then. Um, I was scared out my wits every day, most days. I didn't want to go home. I liked being at school because, <laughs> because I wasn't at home. Um, mm. So by the time I got to 18, 19, I was getting the hell out of Dodge, basically. Um, right. And I moved from my home in Somerset to Liverpool, which is where I live now. Huh? Um, and I came. Back I can hear the Somerset. Can the Somerset. You? Yeah, it's nice when you said Somerset. I could hear it. Somerset twang. So yeah, yeah. I came up to Liverpool, um, and really for the first time felt completely free because I was away from all of that. So I could, I could kind of reinvent myself. I could be mm. whoever I wanted to be. Mm. Um, but that anxiety was so ingrained in me by then. It was just, I, again, I still didn't know it was anxiety. I didn't know that was a thing. I just thought this was who I was as a person. Can you describe what that felt like? Like physically, how do you, how would I know? Or how, how would somebody know if they said to you, like, you're feeling this, you don't know what it is, but later you'll know it's anxiety. What was your physical sensation? So my physical sensation was that I didn't let myself relax very often. 
uh, because you couldn't relax because you didn't know what was coming around the corner next. So it was this constant feeling of walking on eggshells, um, of not knowing what to say or whether to say it or how to say it. Um, if, if I got into trouble at home, I would freeze because, and my brain would go completely blank because I didn't know what, what was the right answer because yeah. I tried so many wrong answers. <laughs> I tried so many different answers and sometimes they were all wrong. So then I just didn't know what to say. So if a grown up got cross with me in any capacity, I would just freeze. I wouldn't, I just, nothing would come out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. um, I was a complete perfectionist. Um, when I started my career, um, my corporate career, I, I was an event manager, which goes with perfectionism beautifully because it's all about the details. But I was a total perfectionist because um, I basically believed if I did stuff perfectly, then I wouldn't get into trouble. Then it wouldn't be, then bad things wouldn't happen. But then bad things still happen. So I just believed I hadn't done it perfectly enough. So... That wow, just, sounds like a formula for depression as well, yeah. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that just drove the perfectionism in me, um, which obviously then leads you to overwhelm and stress. Because, you know, I mean, I lived in a heightened state of stress for many years of my life as well, because, mm. because you w wanted it all to be fine and it wasn't fine and I didn't know why it wasn't fine and it was mm. somehow my fault, but I didn't know why it was my fault. All very confusing for a youngster bless me yes. um and physically i mean i would feel it in my chest i would just have this heaviness in my chest all the time to the point where it was such a it was such a a constant visitor that i kind of numbed it out you know if you have if you have a physical pain of any description that goes on for a while your body kind of numbs it out for you so that you can cope with it and, and mind yeah. it the same thing I, I remember when I was training in mindfulness um almost 10 years ago now I I woke up one morning about halfway through my training and I had the most enormous feeling of anxiety in my chest it felt like mm. I had a rock sitting on my chest mm. um and I realized two things in that moment that completely contradicted each other, but were both true. I realized that I had felt like that every single morning of my life and I'd never noticed before hmm. because my aware, my, my had just numbed it out. So it wasn't until I started practicing mindfulness, which is all about raising your conscious awareness hmm. that this pain came to, and I was like, Oh my goodness. Okay. And I knew that that's how I, I just knew that that's how I felt every day when I woke up. Mm. But I just went through my life pretending I didn't, ignoring it, coping right. with it. Right, right. And, and isn't that like a bridge? For me, that's such a bridge to, in a way, the energy part, the energy side. Because it's like, it's like this energy is on your chest. And even if you don't feel it, it's like it's there. It's there all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and how did... I mean, how did you deal? I imagine also you were a little bit like um, uh, of an addict, is that fair to say, trying to avoid that? Oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, well, and I, I was so used to not, not paying attention that I, that, that I didn't even, like I say, it was just such an ingrained part of me as a person. Mm. And, and it wasn't until I started therapy. I, I got to therapy when I was 25 because my biological dad passed away very suddenly with a heart attack. No. Um, he was literally there one day, had an enormous heart attack, and that was him done, gone. Wow. Um, so that that's what led me to therapy um, because obviously my entire world turned upside down and inside out. Mm. Um, in the in, in the heartbeat. Yeah, literally. he led yeah. he left you again. And it re triggered that trauma of him leaving yeah, you. Totally, yeah, totally. Yeah, wow. Um, and I and I ended up in therapy. I, I mean, I was a complete skeptic. I thought therapy was a load of bunkum, um, load mm. of codswallop. If you couldn't, you know, pull your socks up and get on, you know, ignore, bury what you need to bury, ignore what you need to ignore, and get on with life. That was my. That was my way of doing things because that's mm. how I'd learn to be. Because that's well, that's what we'd learn. learn. That's what, I mean, isn't that so? You know, British stiff upper lip. You know, Absolutely. just that's just repress it. 
yeah, that's it, totally. Push it down, right down. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I had a friend who was having therapy who'd had a similar upbringing to mine, who was having therapy. And she came, came home, we lived together, and she came home from this therapy session one day and said, I was talking to my therapist about you today. This is about a month after my dad died. Um, and he said, she needs to come and see me. Tell her to come and see me. And I burst into tears because I knew that I needed help. I didn't I didn't know which way was up at the time. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, like, yeah. Um, yeah, death is like that. I think death can be such a, an incredible, sounds funny, but incredible gift um, uh -huh. in that it just, it it sort of takes the, the legs from under us um, and then we don't even know how to get up afterwards. Um, there's that whole shock and, and grief. And, and, and it, was, it was funny because I had been um, a confirmed atheist uh, since I was about 14 years old. I thought religion and still do think religion is a load of what's it. Um, but uh, it had been shoved down my throat at school so much. By the time I was 14, I was doing that whole rebellious, no, I'm an atheist, I don't believe sure, in any of this sure. stuff. Um, and when my dad died, who was also an atheist, when he died, the, the only place that I found any peace, I used to go and visit churches and just sit in the back because it was the only place that I could get, I could feel yeah. this peace inside yeah. me, just this quietness because as soon as I stepped outside, it was just noise all over yeah. again, and I didn't know where to go or how to get there. So that was really bizarre for me because I, I was drawn to these churches around where I lived at the time. And I literally just used to go in and sit at the back. And part of me would be like, what am I doing in here? <laughs> Why am I in here? I don't believe in God. Why am I in here? Mm. Um, and now, obviously, I have completely different yeah i mean you know there's there's a powerful energy um in i was in hong kong uh, when my daughter died and um i went to the cathedral uh, st john's and i went to this beautiful temple in diamond hill buddhist temple and you could just like go oh, i can relax here there's there's something here which is telling me everything's okay everything's everything's okay everything's gonna be fine um and um, yeah, just so I, I really look at it as almost like people have built these energetic havens and it doesn't matter what it's called, really. If you if you go there and you feel good, that's enough, you know. Um, and they've even they've even been like friends that I can go and sit with without having to talk to and just feel OK and feel at home. Um, and that's, that's such a gift. It is, and, and I agree with you about the now. I mean, I didn't at the time. I was devastated at the time, but I I know now. I am so grateful for all of that that happened, because I genuinely know that I wouldn't be here, in the place where I am doing the work that I do, believing what right. I believe. It set me on the path for what I do. And what I believe now, you know, now I, I wholeheartedly believe that there is no such thing as death. We, we are eternal beings. We don't die. Our physical mm. bodies go, but but we are eternal. And Did, we have are. you had some evidence for that, like for you, personal evidence or is it it's just uh, a, a knowing? It's that's exactly what I was going to say. It's more of a knowing. And, and it's come from years of of work in a work on myself and um i mean meditation's been a huge part of that but um learning from other healers as i say i've had i mean i had my first bout of therapy when i was 25 <laughs> i've had several bouts of therapy over the years with i've worked with lots of different people um i've talked to lots of different people i've read lots of different stuff and mm. it's the thing that um one of my favorite teachers is abraham hicks Yes. Yes. Um, and and it's it speaks to me. I just it's just that knowing. It's just that yes. This is this is the truth. This it's is, funny, you know. There's a lot of people that, that channel, and I do feel like I get the most. Well, one of the people I get the most from is Hicks. Um, I forget this this lady now that channels 
to Abraham. Anyway, it's just, uh, her, there was a husband, wife, um, partner, partner, and um, yeah, I just felt like um, there's one book asking, asking it will be given. Wonderful book, and I was like, wow, that's it. It's it works, and her story is very interesting. She she just dropped into the silence. You know, she just kept on dropping into the silence, and then this this voice came through. Um, so fascinating. It is fascinating. And that book, Ask and It's Given, I mean, when I read that, it absolutely blew my mind. I was so far along my therapy journey at that point that I was more open to looking at different things. And I read mm. that book and it just, <laughs> part of me was like, no way. And the other part was like, yes, this is this is it. And And I've been a devoted fan of Abraham ever since, really, for years and years. Um, and I, I get something, I get something more out of every teaching. I go back and listen to teachings that I listened to when I first came across them. Mm. And I can remember what I got out of it then, but now I get this out of it because mm. I see so much more myself and I feel so much more myself. Isn't it interesting? I mean, like it's, it's, um, it's such a testimonial to going and uh you know saying like I, I need some help i need i'm not i'm not dealing with this so okay and then uh and then once you've got the help i what i'm almost saying is like you're going back and you're listening to the teachers again i listen to it again there's more there there's like a deepening um you know it's really it's really nice i feel your humility is just really really refreshing <laughs> just said so thank you so much for that thank you um yeah i i think that's for me that's the i mean i don't believe we're ever done if you done in inverted commas we're never done i mean i say to people on a regular basis how boring would it be if we were done oh my goodness me it would you know there's always more i think there's always more that we can learn always more that we can do always more that we can experience and so there should be. Have you ever been to that divine place? Because if you go to the divine place, although it seems like you can't stay there, in that moment, everything's done. That's what I've experienced. Have you got any experience oh, okay. like that? No, I haven't. I want, I want that now. <laughs> no. But it'll, everything will be done now. <laughs> I'm warning you. Like uh, It's really, yeah, sorry about that. So there's this... Um, I forget, I was watching this um, TV show about the guy that had been put into prison for the murder of his wife. He hadn't done it. And he just kept on thinking. Uh, by the way, great YouTube channels on do not speak to the police. If, you're, if they come and talk to you, do not speak to the police. And I don't say that in any way, except that it's a one-sided conversation, because uh, literally, it is anything you say can be used, taken down and used in evidence against you and not for you. So we will we will ignore anything which is for you. Um, and and I was watching um, a police and a police who are studying law and um, um, uh, like lawyer professors of law, you know, uh, doctors of uh, jurists i think they're called jurists and um yes they're just saying like it, it's not a moral thing it's like this is actually a dangerous situation and the cases of miscarriage of justice they often come because people spoke to the police anyway this guy actually does get put in prison he's he's without any material evidence they managed to put him in prison and he keeps on thinking he's going to get out he keeps on thinking he's going to get out. And he has this moment of complete, like, I would say hopelessness and letting go. And he prays. And he says, you know, and two weeks later, there's all of these things are just opening. And he's like, he's let out and exonerated. Within weeks of this moment is such a powerful, like talk about energy work. Energy work can be literally a moment where you just like, okay, I'm gonna let go and let God or let go and let the, the universal intelligence. I need 
something bigger to start turning some cogs here because it's not working on my own. And I I listened to that and I had that experience of going to this divine space, but I listened to that. And that, that night I woke up and often as I do when I wake up in the night, I'll just go and sit down and I'll sit, I'll meditate or I'll, I'll sit. I don't, I do a Taoist practice. It's not actually meditation. And I was just in a state of absolute peace, absolute, 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 beyond, beyond anything I'd ever experienced. Um, and, and I felt like every thought took me out of what took me out of it. If I started thinking it would be out of it, so I go, no, I just want to go back there. I want to go back there. And that was this whole other level. This was like, so that's like, it's a bit like an NDE, sorry, a near death experience, except you're still alive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So have you I, had I, any of that? I have. I, I had actually. Tell, um, tell, tell. I've been having quite a lot of, I've been having quite a lot of um, energy work done this year oh okay. uh, uh, I've been working with a lady who uses something called human design you know, you can that. yes I've heard of human design and one of the most powerful energy workers that I absolutely love she uses it yeah yes and and I I still don't I mean I've been using I've been working with her since well for a few months now I still don't fully understand the human design thing not sure I ever will, but um, but it has it has produced some moments like that for me. I had one a couple of months back at the beginning of September, and it lasted for about ten days. And I was kind of I felt com almost completely disconnected from my normal everyday life because I was just I just kept looking around me, going, "Oh my word, this place is." beautiful this everything in this the energy the, the colors that I was just you know when you blow your own mind <laughs> I just felt like I was walking around with my mind blown for yes. about 10 days and, and yeah. I kept coming back into real life to like cook tea for my family <laughs> and it was the most bizarre experience because I genuinely felt like I was making the decision to come back into everyday life to cook tea or to watch the telly. And then I would go back into this lovely feeling. I think it's called exaltation. It used to be, we don't really use this word anymore, but it's a, it's a cathartic um, uh, experience. I'm forgetting what, there's a wonderful um, word that I've forgotten, but it's like, it's like giving up to the universe. This, something like that and then we go into this this states of exaltation which is i mean it it's a it's a word i mean we can say enlightenment you know we talk about enlightenment buddha but we used to talk about exaltation yeah or no, gnosis where we have this uh knowing yeah uh gnos these gnostic 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 i think with the g pronounced it's better yeah. Gnostic. It's gnostic. It sounds it sounds good, doesn't it? Gn that is gnostic. Yeah. Like so, so anyway, I was good. Exaltation. I like the use of that. That sounds yes. right. That sounds like and, what I experienced. Yeah, I think I I think it's it's about it really is about energy. It really is. Um and I find that you know, you say you do hypnosis. Um, I developed I developed some energy work called uh, emotional grammar, and it's really about word. And word is so incredibly powerful. One word, as Richard Bandler said, one word paints a thousand pictures. Um, you know, it's just so. So, so how did you like? You became a hypnotherapist. Was it you became a mindfulness person and then became a hypnotherapist? So no, I, I, I came to hypnotherapy first because hypnotherapy was the therapy that I had experienced in my mid twenties. So, mm. um, and my, that therapist was somebody that I went back to time and again. Um, so I, I, when I had my children in my mid thirties, so 10 years later, that like 
rocked. I could trigger you. Yeah. I I know, my God. It was the most beautiful, amazing thing. I'd always wanted kids. I I mean, because I didn't have a very (laughs) happy childhood, I wanted children so that I could have a happy childhood, if that makes sense. Um, So I wanted kids forever. And I was in my mid to late thirties when I finally had my two beautiful daughters. And I mean, love just like no other, but it also brought up all kinds of rubbish from- I was gonna say, yeah, I was gonna say, especially when they reached the age of five. Oh, absolutely. uh, And and stuff that I hadn't looked at in therapy before because it just hadn't come up. Um, so, So it was a massively challenging time for me because I was aware of how amazing it was whilst also feeling like I was turning into the grown-ups from my childhood, which I massively didn't want to happen, obviously. And that sent me back to therapy. Um, I mean, I've been for various bits before, but that sent me back to my original therapist again in my late 30s. And that's when I started training. I said to him as a result of these sessions that I was having to sort this childhood stuff out, I said to him, So I need a new career because I had a four-year-old and a two-year-old and children and event management don't mix. It wasn't, event management is not a child-friendly industry to work in the hours, it's ridiculous. Um, So I'd given up work by that point. And I said to my therapist, do you think I could do what you do? And he said to me, I've been waiting 10 years for you to ask me that question. It, oh. isn't it isn't it true though like the deeper you can go into trance and allow yourself into that um process sorry did you lose me for a second so yeah because you're going deep I into the lose you, so I don't know what yeah we, um, we got an um, unstable connection for a second um but the deeper you're able to let yourself into the hypnotic process as a as a client the better you are able to to be a therapist I think um I think yeah. so and, and I mean I had I mean when I first experienced hypnosis and hypnotherapy I was very much a con- I was very closed I was a control freak um mm. I you know I needed to be in control of everything so I would rehearse the answers that I was going to give my therapist in my therapy session before I got to my therapy session because I needed to know that I was in control of what was happening and and what obviously the more I experienced hypnosis the more I allowed myself to relax and let go and the more shifts that I could make and now mm. I train other people to become hypnotherapists because for me, it's the, I, I describe it as the closest thing to real life Harry Potter magic that I've ever, I've ever experienced and I've ever come across. And I've seen so many amazing shifts happen. Oh, totally. I mean, it, it's a fascinating thing. I mean, it developed with Mesmer, didn't it, with these, these uh, strokes. And then you have Esdale in, in India putting people um, in trance so that they can have limbs amputated yeah without any pain or any anesthetic um i mean it is it is very close to magic it's amazing i mean my my um my original therapist is a gentleman called Eamon. um he trained me um he's like a he's part of our family now he's like an adopted granddad to my two children and everything Mm. he's just a fixture in our family um but he he if he goes to the dentist or has any procedures at the doctors he will put himself he doesn't have anesthetic or the you know anything he he will put himself into hypnosis to have whatever procedure done um it is amazing is absolutely amazing Mm. and you're right i think the more you open yourself up i don't think that you know without hypnotherapy I without doing that training I don't think I would have come across mindfulness I I trained in mindfulness out of pure curiosity because I kept hearing all this these amazing stories about this thing called mindfulness that was quite new I mean obviously I know now it's unbelievably old but um that it was quite this new thing and loads of people were like it was changing their lives and when I when I looked into it as to what it was I was like I don't understand how something so simple yeah. is making all these, like, I already know all this stuff. I don't understand how it's making any difference to anyone's life. 
and um and so then I trained in it and genuinely felt like someone had found a second pair of eyelids and opened them and gone there you are that's life that's it that's what that's what it's supposed to be that's how amazing it is that's how beautiful it is that's all the things you walk past in your day every day and pay no attention to Mm -hmm. um because you take them for granted and you just oh my goodness it just blew my mind completely Mm -hmm. um and and without both of those practices, I don't think, you know, then I came across Abraham Hicks and then started on the more energetic side of, of you know, and I'm very proud now I say to people, you know, I use hypnotherapy and mindfulness with a healthy dose of intuition um, right. and tuning into my energy and your energy, which I yes. know now, obviously, that I've been doing for years as a hypnotherapist, but I didn't know at the start. So I don't think without those practices, I wouldn't have got to where I am now and I'm nowhere near where I will be I'm very sure but. I was going to say what what's what's coming up what's coming up for happiness Joe <sighs> that's such a good question um for now for me personally it's all about more discovery um discover more. energy work my podcast yeah, oh my God, spooky but I think that is I mean I wanted to read you while you were asking me a question before I found a message that I sent to my friend who is also an energy worker um when I was experiencing that couple of weeks of beautiful bliss and and I described it to her so I could if, if it's all right I thought I would read it to you um because it's really hard to describe it now I'm not in it but this is what I wrote to her. I said, I'm having a very bizarre but beautiful experience today and yesterday. And then it went on for another 10 days or so. I can distinctly feel two parts of me, human part and soul divine part. I feel peaceful and safe at my core like never before. And I feel as though I know that feeling will last. I've experienced snippets of this before, but not to this depth and not consistently for very long. Then I can feel my human me start to question things but it's like it's very distant and my soul part is almost immediately saying it's all good everything's fine trust in it all I don't want to do anything I just want to sit in this feeling it feels like a bit like I'm struggling to be human do you know do you hear I hear that you're what I was talking about my divine moments I hear yeah. that that you've had it you just didn't call it that didn't call it that yeah yeah and um yeah, I mean that sounds like it does sound like you've got a um, a you you miss that state. You'd like to go back there. Oh good God, yes, I'd go back there now. Mm. And and I don't. I'm thinking back now. I'm I'm not entirely sure where it came from or how I reached it. <laughs> but it's like it's not like I sat down and did. I mean, I meditate every day. I so I, I think yeah, Joe. I. I think one of the things that I, I'm inspired about is and, and teaching it is the mystery. And I think the, it is the mystery. We are a mystery. We don't know who we are. We don't know where we're going. Yeah. And um, that, that's not a bad thing. You know, it, it, the mystery is, you know, it's everywhere. But that's it, isn't it? It's, it's about allowing it to. And I mean, I'm not saying... I do still struggle with this, but it is about allowing it all to unfold. And we don't like that as human beings, do we? We like to know. We like to know what's going to happen next. Uh, when I talk about um, the pandemic and the experience that we've all been through over the last couple of years, yeah, I say to people, you know, what happened? The reason why, I mean, there's a mental health crisis happening in the UK like never before. Um, And I say to people, because what's happened is all those constructs that we put in place, all those structures that we put in place as human beings to make us feel safe, were all ripped away in five seconds flat. And Mm. so obviously that causes fear and panic because we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen and we don't know where we're going. But actually, as you say, that's the eternal journey anyway. But it's what we need to embrace it is definitely what we need to embrace yeah. and it's where it's where the energy appears actually if you've yeah. got your your 
uh, as you say, like your st the structure of the way you perceive reality, and it's so fixed. Well, you know, um, if you go into that no mind space and looking at the mystery, you can drop it because it's like, well, and then stuff appears, then new stuff appears in your reality. And it's kind of like, it's kind of amazing. But I, I was actually thinking of, you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect? Yeah. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Thinking, I have heard. Like, you have? Yeah. Yeah. So the Dunning-Kruger effect is, is people with a little bit of knowledge are incredibly confident. Um, and people with a lot of knowledge, they tend to be less confident. And I think that's so about so much about life. Uh, it's um, yeah. There's lots of there's lots of examples. I mean, the the people that that you know confidently um, the amateurs that confidently do the wiring of something, and you know um, where a where a, a, an electrician is going. Well, that's actually a really difficult thing to do. I'm not sure how, how I do it. And people, yeah, you know, have a go. Um, but uh, I find that yeah. Almost actually, confidence is almost a um, a curse on mankind. We, our confidence stops us stops us experiencing what we don't know. And uh, yeah, hmm. I like that. I like that a lot. Actually, that, that that ties in with something I've been doing over the last few days. I've been um, just experimenting with tuning in more to myself. Because I talk a lot in my work, I talk a lot about love and fear and where our responses come from, whether they come from a place of love and whether they come from a place of fear. And I very much obviously want all of my responses to come from a place of love. Yeah. But I'm also very aware that they don't always. Right. So I've been tuning in, having a little experiment with myself for the last few days and tuning in to where my responses to things are coming from and what. And a lot of them do come from fear. A lot of them mm. are coming from a place of fear. I mean, silly things like we have a puppy um, that I'm still training and he's a retriever. So he's quite big, but he's, but he's a baby. Mm. And so when I take him on walks, he gets ridiculously excited about seeing other people, which is lovely, and other dogs. And obviously not everyone wants a retriever dog, like, rah, jumping at them. So I do my best to to keep him away from other dogs while I'm still training him. But where I'm walking him, there's lots of people that walk the dogs without leads. And I was getting really wound up about it. And really like, and I said to myself, well, okay, so why, why am I getting this wound up about this? And I realized that it was because there's a fear in me that, that he will attack them or they will attack him. And that then one of them will attack me and that I will get hurt. And, but actually, that was all buried right down deep inside me. And actually I was just getting annoyed with Mrs. Smith who wasn't putting her dog on a lead. But that was a complete fear response in me. Um, so mm. I'm just finding it really, I mean, it's such a silly little everyday thing, but, but that's the experiment I'm doing with myself at the moment. Why am I responding to that like that? What is, what is that triggering in there? There's fear there. There's, and I'm actually, amazed at how much fear there is in my responses to things right. um, when I when consciously I want my responses to be from a place of love so I mean, it's, it's just a really journey like, isn't it it's just like this yeah. never-ending never-ending journey um, not 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 referring to Michel Ender Michael Ender's um, book um, but he was a wise man you know it, it really is a never-ending journey there are a lot of things we have to wrap up um, because it's just we try and keep this at like 40 minutes because I think it's it's a nice sort of size that you go over an hour. I think people are thinking, well, I better really put aside the time. Um, but I think you've got lots of, I mean, it's been a great, great pleasure having you visit us and, uh, and sharing your perspective, your experiences. And really, you know, I'd say your journey. Um, Thank you so much. I hope the Discover Energy work uh, can put some people in, you know, in touch with what you're doing. Um, and, you know, that's the reason I love to share people's stories uh, or inspire people to maybe do something similar or, or something, you know, who knows. But uh, yeah, it's really great. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much for having me on. 
I will, I will press stop and 